Thanks for watching. Welcome back to my Bible study. I am traveling. Haven't been able to post last week because once I got out, I realized it was super, super hot and I had to get north as quickly as possible. So I am here. So I'm ready to do my Bible study. This is going to get a little interesting because of the deception that I felt that I was under with Genesis. I'm using my creative Bible today. I got my notes over here. I've already colored in the pages for the famous apple. I'm going to bring you all the way to Genesis 3 today and then I'm going to stop and then I'm going to post a video that I've been uh, getting ready to post and it's a video about the subject and um, I want you to just listen to this and then let me finish that other video so that you can watch and understand how deep this goes. So let's get into Genesis. Let's see how long this can get today. Let's start. Let's first talk about what Genesis is. Genesis is the very first book of the Bible. And the meaning of Genesis, the origin is, it's the origin is birth and the beginning. That's what the word Genesis means. And that's what the book is about. It's about the beginning of the world. It's about the beginning of all of, the, of God's creation. And that's what we're going to talk about. The way it talks about the universe. It talks about the beginning of humanity. It talks about sin, and this is why we have so many problems in the world. It talks about civilization, mankind, and then of course it talks about the Jewish nation. And a lot, most of the Bible is about the Jewish nation and the lineage of, the, of, of Jesus Christ later on, who saves us from sin in the world. So let's get to it. Let's start with... Let's get to it. Let's start with Genesis 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the water. I just love this because you know, if you read this out loud in the King James, it's my favorite because it says, In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. He didn't create the He didn't create anything else he created heaven so heaven has an important place like realize that God was not in heaven God created heaven so that tells you that there is a specific place called heaven which is really important a lot of people think oh there's no such place no the Bible tells us that God created two places he created heaven and he created the earth and when we understand that and understand the significance and the importance of everything the meaning of the Bible if we understand this very sentence in the beginning tells us he created two things heaven and earth and the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters so the earth was basically without a form it was kind of like I'm gonna think of it as some kind of like energy like a mass of energy a, 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 a ball of energy he was starting to create it and he created it because it was form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep so there was a it was like a he, it was like a manifestation of energy and he was starting to create it and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters so he started to create it like the waters it just started to manifest you know everything comes from water you know that if they look for water on different planets because they know that if with water there can be civilizations they can literally build civilizations so everything comes from water so that tells us that God moved upon the face of the waters creation of the light and God said let there be light and there was light and God saw the light that it was good and God divided the light from the darkness so and God saw the light the light was the Sun and it was good and God divided the light from the darkness and God called the light day and darkness he called it night and the evening and the morning were the first day so the night was the moon and the light was the Sun creation of the firmament this is when it really gets good it says, and God said, let there be a firmament. And God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters. And let it divide the waters from the waters. 
So, and God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters and let it divide the waters from the waters. He says, in the midst of the water, he put the land and let it divide the water. So you have the Atlantic Ocean, the different oceans. So they're divided. The, the water doesn't touch because there's land in the middle. So now if you have the land, it's going to touch the land. So that's what the firmament is, the land. And God made the firmament and divided the water which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so. So he made the firmament, he divided the waters which were under, so there's water under the firmament. But there's also waters above the firmament. So this is the water that's going to be up in the sky. We also have water in the sky. And God called the firmament heaven. So you understand that heaven is not some made up thing. I mean, it's very clear here that he may have a purpose. He had a purpose for the planet, for the earth, and he had a purpose for heaven. So when a lot of people tell you, oh, you're going to go to heaven, they, they play it off like some car cartoon character. Look at the first seven sentences of the Bible, how it talks about heaven so many times in there. Because it's part of the plan. It was just part of the plan. And the evening and the morning were the second day. So now you have the second day, which is the morning and the night. Then it goes on to say in chapter, in, uh, in verse 9, it says, And God said, Let the waters under the heaven be gathered together unto one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. So now you just don't see land. Now you actually see dry land. So probably you're going to start to see mountains and sand and all these different things that he's building, that he's creating as he's putting this stuff on the firmament. So the firmament is the portion that divides, but now the land is the various different terrains that is on there. Let the waters under the heaven be gathered together unto one place, and let the dry land appear, and it was so. And let the waters under the heaven be gathered together. So the waters under the heaven to me is going to be, okay, heaven is above us, there's different some people say that there's different um, sections to heaven there's different levels so for us that is our atmosphere that's why we have water here because when it rains we have water we have the clouds and those are under heaven so heaven is higher it's at a higher place than here but you do realize that the earth is where we're at but there is more to it than that it's like um it's almost like a like a place there's another place there that God created and then there was this and God called the dry land earth and the gathering together of the waters called he seas and God saw that it was good so the dry land was considered now earth now we actually have a name which is called planet earth which is the dry land is called earth and the gathering together of the waters called the seas so we have the earth, which is the actual planet earth, but the earth is the land, considered the land, and the seas, which is the waters. And God saw that it was good. And God said, let the earth bring forth grass. The, here, the herb, so the grass was to sprout. It was supposed to be, the grass was supposed to be sprouting. The herb yielding seed. Herb yielding is medicinal. Herb yielding means Herb yielding seeds or seed for medicinal plants. We're supposed to get, our, our pharmacy is supposed to come mostly from herb yielding plants. And the fruit tree yielding fruit and his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth. And it was so, whose seed is in itself upon the earth. That tells me that when the seed falls down, it grows onto itself. It doesn't need anything else. Like a woman and a man where you need her seed and his sperm to connect and make a baby. In this place it says, whose seed is in itself upon the earth and it was so. So when it falls to the ground and it hits the soil and the water and the sun and all of these things from the things that he created before all of those things were starting to create the plants that we have and the trees and the fruits and all that 
and he and the earth brought forth grass and herb yielding seed after his kind so after his kind means after the kind of itself a grass grows grass the certain seed if it's an almond seed it grows an almond seed peanut it grows has peanut seed the tree everything of its own kind that's very important to him because if you see it's of its own kind and that's part of nature's laws that when there's production and and uh, um, reproduction let's say reproduction in fruits and things like that it's based on kind this is why a lot of the churches don't teach you this kind of stuff because they don't want you to know that it's based on kind all right so seed after his kind and the tree yielding fruit whose seed was in itself after his kind and God saw that it was good so it's important for him to know in the Bible that the seed has to be of its kind of its own kind if you have an almond tree, the seed that falls from there is going to grow another almond seed. It's not going to grow squash and carrots. It's going to grow an almond tree. And it's going to produce like that because of its own kind. Look how important this stuff is to God. He wants reproduction. He wants all of this happening in the world. But it has a natural law that he's making because he's telling you it must be of its kind and the evening and the morning were the third day so that's that's uh, verse 13. now we'll go to verse 14 where it says and god said let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years so we get from there we get probably the moon and the planets and some other things that are going to show us when they're positioned in the sky you know the seasons when it's cold when it's warm so we, we look at the sky we kind of know when things are happening which is great and let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth and it was so God made two great lights the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night he made the stars also so he also he's talking there about how he made the the, uh, the the stars and all of that God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness and God saw that it was good and the evening and the morning were the fourth day so now we're on the fourth day now we have more indication of some of the natural laws of light there's the sun comes up all the time during the day the moon comes up at night it doesn't change it doesn't waver it's not maybe I'll come out maybe I won't these are natural laws built by creation and they they happen all the time there's the moon's always going to come out the sun's always come out yes it's going to be cloudy whatever but all of these things happen so these are natural laws that god created so number 20 verse 20 says and god said let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creatures that hath life and fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of the heaven so the open firmament is that layer that place between heaven and earth but it's he's, he's calling it it's there's levels to it so this is our atmosphere this is the firmament is all of this is considered part of planet earth it's not just the planet is the ball it's not it's just not the planet it is it seems like between the planet and heaven there is a spiritual realm there that we don't see but at the same time he's saying let the waters um, bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life which is the fish of course and fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven so in other words he also created birds so that they can fly in that open section between heaven and earth there's that area there where of course there's our sky but there's more to it than that and God created great whales and every living creature that moveth this is this is verse 21 which the waters brought forth abundantly 
after their kind and every winged fowl after his kind. Notice again how he said, living creature that moved with which the waters brought forth abundantly. So that means there was lots of fish in the water, all different kinds of species, because he says, after their kind and every winged fowl after his kind, God saw that it was good. So he specifically had them abundant, reproducing abundantly according to their kind. Eagles with eagles, whales with whales, dolphins with dolphins, nothing of dolphins and and eagles, none of that. It's always going to be the species mating with its own species. These are natural laws of God. You have to you have to understand these are natural laws. It's written in the Bible because it's a natural law. It doesn't want the tainting of genetics. And God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters in the seas, and let fowl multiply in the earth. So he wanted them to be fruitful and multiply, but he wanted to make sure that they were of their own kind. And the evening and the morning were the fifth day. And this is uh, verse 24 says, And God said, Let the earth bring forth the living creatures after his kind, cattle and creeping thing and beasts of the earth, after his kind and it was so here we are again he's speaking very specific god is very specific you are not to play around with the species you are not going to cross contaminate the species each animal it has to reproduce according to its kind cows with cows horses with horses it's very clear here what he's saying and god made the beast of the earth after his kind and cattle after their kind and everything that creepeth upon the earth after his kind and God saw that was good now some people say that the beasts of the earth were the dinosaurs and we know that there were dinosaurs that roamed the earth because we've seen uh, uh, skeletons and bones of them so that's probably what that was he's referring to the beasts which are those beasts after his kind and the cattle so you know, T-Rex with T-Rex and Brontosaurus with Brontosaurus, they ain't going to mix together. Okay, then it goes to 26, it says, And God said, Let us make man in our own image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish and the sea. So let us make man in our image. So he wants to make man in in his image of what man is man is a so to me man is able to create and that's why we're able to build so many wonderful things because we can use our imagination to create just like god can but the difference is you always have to worship god is the ultimate creator you cannot try to be above god he is the ultimate creator of course and make a man in our image so we are he's not making us like him he's making us in his image that means that we are similar to him but don't have the powers that he has because ultimately God is God and let them have dominion over the fish and the sea so he gives man the ability to be created on earth so that it can take care of the earth and make sure that the earth is well is in good standing you have dominion over the fish in the sea over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeping upon the earth man was made to care for this planet to take care of this planet so God created man in his own image in the image of God created he him male and female created he them so it's in this verse before he created the female he's talking about God created him he's talking about the male but he's also talking about the female there so when he creates the male he creates a female also if that makes sense to you in that image which is ultimately both of them are in the image of God so this is where he's talking about the creation of humans. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply, 
and replenish. So I want you to see how this is important in this verse. It says, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. The verse right after that is really important because we're talking about humankind here. Even though he has a real, we haven't got to the story of how he created Adam and Eve, but he's already talking about, he's projecting creating man and woman. But listen to the next verse where he says, And God blessed them, and God said unto them, he wasn't talking to the animals only. The animals were supposed to be reproducing unto their kind. In this verse, he's talking about humankind. He's telling them, and God blessed them. And so being blessed means you're going to be fertile. Because in the, right after that, he said, God said unto them, be fruitful. He wanted them to have, there's only one way to be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. How are people going to be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and if you don't have sex? Sex is a blessing from God. It is something that is special. He, he took his time to note between verse 27 and 28 that there is there's a difference there between the animals and humans and in this particular verse he's telling us that he wants man and female to multiply and be fruitful and replenish the earth and the only way that they're going to do that is with sexual intercourse okay so how did we get to the point in the next couple of verses to misconstrue all of this because right here is telling you to be fruitful and multiply and of course sex is part of that so let's continue let's go to 29 and then it says and God said behold I have given you every herb bearing seed which is upon the face of all the earth and every tree in the which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed to you it shall be for meat seed is not there just to reproduce the seed he's telling you is like meat you can eat it you can eat the almond uh, seed you can eat the walnut seed even though it's made to reproduce the meat the inside part you can eat it so he's clarifying that and to every beast of the earth and to every fowl of the air and to everything that creepeth upon the earth wherein there is life I have given every green herb for meat and it was so so in other words my interpretation of the green herb for me is is uh, it's, it's 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 medical you know it's 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 to heal you to make you feel better and you could eat from those things that are going to make you feel better and God saw everything that he had made and behold it was very good and the evening and the morning were the sixth day so then now we're going to go to chapter 2 thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all the host of them and on the seventh day God ended his work which he had made and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made and God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made and that's why we have the first Sabbath which is the day of rest okay the manner of the creation is number chapter chapter 2 verse 4 says these are the generations of the heavens and of the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God the God made the earth and the heavens and every plant of the field before it was in the earth and every herb of the field before it grew for the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth and there was not a man to till the ground but there went up a mist from the earth watered the whole face of the ground so in other words everything was pretty much didn't need to be taken care of by man didn't need to be tilled or soiled or anything like that everything was abundant and grew uh, normally just because there was mist in the air and it just everything was perfect and the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed he breathed into his nostril the breath of life 
and man became a living soul. So remember, without your breath, without your breathing, you will die on this planet. Breathe into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul soul. Remember, he already had plans to do it, because if we go back to chapter 1, to, uh, chapter, to chapter 1, verse 27 and 28, he was already considering man. So God already knows what he's going to do. In this verse, he's actually, we're actually talking about the creation of how he made man. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed. Okay, we read that. And then number 8 says, and the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. So in other words, he created the man. He had formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils. And this man became a living soul. Verse 9 says, And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life, life also in the midst of the garden and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Oh, God is talking here about food. Food was important back then because it was a sustenance. Other than, other than him creating man, what sustains man after God's creation, after God's creation, is the food that he is abundantly providing man with. In this, in this garden because that's the only way the man is going to survive. He needs to have this food. So let's go to chapter 2, verse 10. And a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from thence it was parted and became into four heads. The name of the first is Pison, that is it which compasseth the whole land of Havalah, where there is gold. And the gold of that land is good. There is Bedellum and the onyx stone, and the name of the second river is Gahan. The same it is it that compasseth the whole land of Ethiopia. And the name of the third river is Hedekel, that is it which goeth toward the east of Assyria, and the four river is the fourth river is Euphrates. So all of these water sources are very important. And the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. So the man was in there just to kind of take care of it, make sure that everything was presentable and pleasing to God. And it gave him the ability to work, to pass his days working and blessing God, worshiping God through his work. And the Lord God commanded the man saying, of every tree of the garden thou mightest eat freely. So he gave the man free will to eat whatever he wanted there. He had a choice. He could have an apple. He can have a grape. He can have whatever he wanted. He gave him choice. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it, for in that day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. So man had a choice, but this particular tree was not a choice. And God expected obedience from man in that level that it's just like the natural laws of life he don't ex doesn't expect us to start crossing a man with a goat he doesn't expect us a man with a horse he doesn't expect us to be disobedient to his natural laws and one of his natural laws was not to eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil and the Lord God said it is not good that the man should be alone I will make him and help and help meet for him. So this is what he's telling that he's going to create the woman. He's already talked about it in the first chapter that he was planning on doing this. So at this point, this is what he wanted to provide a woman for him because it wasn't good for him to be alone. And um, remember in the beginning, he wanted them to multiply the earth. Physically and spiritually having that connection, that bond together um, that love for each other under under God and that blesses God when you have two people join together in love and doing service to God and 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 it pleases God and and it's a way of worshiping when people are multiplying and he sees his creation you know in the garden I mean God had a probably had a vision of little children in the garden and Eve and just a real holy pure place of happiness, of beauty, of abundance, 
just a really wonderful place. And out of the, okay, so we'll go on to the next one. And out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all the cattle and to the fowl of the air and to every beast. But for Adam, there was not found an help meet for him. So we're already hearing that God is already preparing that, realizing that, you know, the lions have mates, the horses have mates. Adam needed a mate. And God always knows in advance what he's going to be doing. That's why he talked about it in chapter 1. And Adam gave, okay, so Adam gave all the names of the animals. And the Lord God, so we're going to 21 now, it says, And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. And he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. There's a lot of things that are very interesting about the rib cage of a man and a woman. So you can look for those yourself online, but there's a lot of interesting straits if you look for the information on the ribs. And God, Adam, and Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. So you see how in this verse, God is already planning the abundance of these people, of these two, to, to multiply because he already said it in chapter 1. He expected them to multiply. Sexual intercourse wasn't the sin, like we're all led to believe. We'll get to that in a second, and then I'm going to drop it there so that we can continue. But God is already telling you there, there's three places in the Bible we haven't even gotten to the part of sin where he's already projecting that this is going to be a normal thing for humans to be doing. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. So he expects them to be joined in matrimony, to be you know, not necessarily a sermon, but to be joined together forever. And when he's saying leave your father and mother, he knows that these two are going to eventually be a father and a mother because you're going to have children who are going to um, be fruitful and multiply in the planet. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. So they were walking around naked and they were perfectly fine with it. It was just the two of them. They were blessed by God to be together, to be, you know, loving to each other. And that was perfectly fine. We're going to get to chapter 3. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field, which the Lord God has made. And he said unto the woman, Ye hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. So let's talk for a second about this serpent. Because if you go back to Revelations 12 and 9, about the importance of how God is always knows the beginning and the end. So in Revelations 12 and 9, I'm going to go back here and read it to you. We're going to make sure that we know what that is, what the serpent is. 12 9. 12, 9 reads, And the great dragon was cast out, this is in Revelations, that old serpent called the devil, and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world, he was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So that's important for you to know. So that gives you an idea that this whole book, from the very beginning, talks about Satan, the devil, the wicked one through all of these pages you're going to see also a lot of talk about that and it goes all the way to revelation to the ending and why all these bad things happen on the planet so let's break this down a bit now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field of course he was very subtle he was very conniving is what i understand with of the field which the lord god had made and he said unto the woman you got he shall not eat of every tree of the garden. So he questioned her. It started with a question. It put doubt in her mind. Doubt. Oh, he doesn't love you? Oh, oh, he's out with on a business trip with another woman and then you start to doubt. You know, those kind of things. That kind of 
subliminal um, subtlety. Number two says, And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees and the garden, she said. But number three, she tells him, But of the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. So not just are you going to savor it, you are also not going to touch it. So listen to the listen to what God is telling her here. Somewhere in the middle it was this place. Then number six says, Okay, for God knoweth that in that day then your eyes shall be open and ye shall be as God. Okay, so and the serpent said unto the woman in verse four, Ye shall not surely die. God doth know that in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. So he's already deceiving her and telling her and putting doubt in her mind about God. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, so she listened to him, she obeyed him, she believed him. He tricked her, but listen to him. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant in the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her and he did eat. So right there they both did something that they shouldn't have done that was wrong. And the eyes of them both were open and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. Number verse nine, and the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, where art thou? And he said, I heard my voice in the garden, and I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told thee that thou was naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shalt not eatest? And the man said, The woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree. So he's already saying, Oh, the woman, it was her fault. She was the one who convinced me. And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent, listen to this. This is, this is, this is important. This is what she tells God. She goes, the woman said to God, she says, the serpent beguiled me and I did it. So she was honest. She confessed her sin. But what does the word, the serpent beguiled me? The word beguiled is important here because it means charmed or enchanted deceptively. So he charmed her. And what does that tell you? That tells me charm deceptively is a sexual term because beguiled enchanted why would he enchant her into an apple that makes absolutely no sense i do believe that the apple is a metaphor for something and the reason that i understand it to be so is because god wants us to keep our mind pure as pure and not be specific into what the act is like a lot of things in the Bible they don't go into details but the acts they just generalize it and especially if you're gonna have children reading the Bible he doesn't want children to know that what happened there so let's continue so that you have an idea of what I'm talking about the serpent is cursed so now we already talked in Revelations 12 9 who the serpent is because it's already mentioned in the end of the Bible what it is so verse 14, chapter 3 says, And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast dust this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust thou shalt eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity. Okay, now this is the important part. This is where it starts getting. This is where the deception comes in that most people don't tell you about. Verse 15 says, And I will put enmity. Enmity is means hostility between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. So he's talking to Satan here between his seed and her.
her seed. Okay, so she's got a seed, he's got a seed. She has a seed and he has a seed. There's two seeds there. There's two seeds. She was impregnated. She slept with the serpent first. This is why sin was so atrocious what she did. She had not she had not had sex yet with Adam. She had sex with the serpent first. And then she stepped with Adam because she taught Adam what was done. Okay? This is what happened. She showed him what happened. Between thy seed and her seed, it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. So what she had was twins. She ended up having twins. There's a video coming up on that. I'm getting it ready for you. I know you guys are not going to believe me, but there's a lot of proof about this. And I'm telling you, just keep your eyes open to listen because you're going to understand why we are sinful in nature. The punishment God promises for mankind comes up now. Unto the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over her, over thee. And the reason for that desire, she desires her husband, is because now her relationship was tarnished. Her relationship was tarnished because now he understood that she slept with someone else before he slept with her. Their relationship now was always going to have that problem in there. And she was always going to feel guilt, I guess you could say, um, because of what she did. Because this was going to have serious consequences for her for the rest of her life. Now she had two seeds in her. She had the seed of evil. She had the seed of the Lord. Two different things in there. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife. So now he's telling Adam, because he was also betrayed, he listened to her and he knew better he should have not listened to her but remember the Satan beguiled her and I'm not surprised if she also beguiled Adam the same way that she was beguiled so she learned something from the other one she learned deception she learned to charm this is why we have a lot of Jezebels and women out there who have this thing now because she used it on Adam as well. The same thing she learned, she used it on him. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of the wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee. So if God commanded, this wasn't like, a, this, was, this was an actual command of God's. He saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. So now he's going to have to work the garden the blessings aren't going to come the way they were so fruitful. Everything was abundant. He hardly had to do any work in the garden. Now he had to really work for it because he had a punishment coming because he should have stood his ground and he should have said no. Horns also and thistle shall it bring forth to thee and thou shalt eat the herbs of the field. This is the meaning of thistle. Thistle belongs to a polyphyletic group. Do not share an immediate ancestor, convergent evol evaluation, have similar form and function. Sweat of thy face, thou shalt eat bread, till thou return unto the ground, for out of it was thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. So in other words, he's going to really have to work for his food, just like what we said. And eventually he's going to have to die, because this is the first time that we are t listening to that there is now death. So in other words, when God created man before sin came into the world, there was no death. But in this, he's telling us that dust thou art, and thou dust shall return. So in other words, Adam will return to the earth because there will be death. And Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. She was the mother of all living, not just his seed of all living that means she was the mother of the sin and she was the mother of the seed of god so you understand that there's two that's why it says she was the mother of all of all living unto adam also and to his wife did the lord god make coats of skins and clothes him so at this part this is the first time that we are actually knowing that god has made her his official wife because now she's carrying these children in her side of her and so now they have to be 
married, they are married to each other. And she is considered his wife at this point. It's forever and ever. The Lord God said, Behold, the man is become as one of us to know good and evil. And now lest he put forth his hand and take also of the fruit of life and eat and live forever. Man knows not that there's good and there's evil. Now that man knows about good and evil, now he's got to get them out of there because now he doesn't want them to go to the tree of life and eat of that also, whatever that is. We don't know what that is. So, therefore the Lord God sent them forth from the Garden of Eden to, to till the ground for whence he was taken. So he drove out the man and he placed it in the east of the Garden of Eden with the cherubims, the Garden of Eden cherubims, and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. He made sure that this tree of life was protected because now he was afraid that they were going to get into it. That is what I'm going to leave you with today. I have an important video that I'm doing with this subject because I've done a lot of research on it. And I just want you to take it in and think of it for right now. There's two seeds. We're going to get more into it. That video that's coming up. So, so let's summarize the chapter for a second. Um, in Genesis, we read that God created a wonderful universe with the perfect world for humans. They were blessed from the very beginning. God had a beginning and an end for them. Do not blame God for things that happened. So they couldn't go back and blame God. They were, they, were, they were honest. They were honest with God. They did confess what happened. They didn't blame God for it. God gave humans the choice. He didn't put the cherubims in front of the trees before because he didn't distrust them. He gave them the freedom to choose and to make up their own decisions. Unfortunately, her decisions came from being deceived charmed deception was used on her ultimately humans are responsible because of the misuse of those freedoms so this is why sin came into the world adam and eve only had one rule not to eat of this particular did, tree but they did this sin hurt their intimate relationship with god and sin means to miss the mark so they missed the mark they were there was a, a, a there was a natural law planned for them and they missed the mark and because they missed the mark now they contaminated the world it is spiritual toxin that came and entered the world now she has a seed of the devil and she has the seed of god the bible is based on god working to restore his relationship this is what the whole bible is about this whole book from the beginning to the end you go you read Genesis and then you skip everything and go to Revelation you're going to see that the entire book basically is about God's plan to restore the earth the relationship that he promised to have humans before sin entered the earth that's his ultimate plan because his plan for the earth was of, of a beautiful place of holiness and purity and that wasn't what happened ultimately he just wants to get rid of sin we'll get to that when we get to the Noah's Ark later on in those chapters there but for now I just want you to sleep with this idea I want you to think about it and I'll have some videos and my next video that I'm going to post I'm going to also have some proof videos talking to you and showing you the evidence about a lot of the stuff which is going to be more visual than what I have for you so I thank you for watching today and I hope you have a wonderful day and don't forget to give this video a thumbs up